Good afternoon, everyone. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce our uh, author at Google today. Uh, I'm Alan Moss from Google and have the opportunity to introduce my, my friend and accomplished writer, Meg Clayton. Um, Meg is here to talk about her latest novel, The Wednesday Sisters. And the setting for the book, I think, is one that a lot of us in the local area can relate to. It occurs uh, nearby in Palo Alto, but it also occurs in an important time in history. Uh, the setting for the book is in the late 60s, and it weaves a really compelling narrative about five women who are developing an incredible relationship and, in many ways, looking to find their voices, their voices in society, their voices as aspiring writers. Um, there's lots of things for, for all of us to enjoy in this book. As, uh, as a company that's located here in the heart of Silicon Valley, uh, there are mentions of the early days of Silicon Valley and, and uh, Bob Noyce character, which I enjoyed. There's um, a lot of information about what's going on in the United States at the time with the women's movement, with, um, with war protests and other, other uh, events that filled that time. And um, if you haven't read this book, you need to read it. It's a terrific read. I know you'll enjoy it. Um, Meg's, Meg is the author of The Language of Light. Um, her stories and writings have appeared in numerous publications, including Runner's World, as well as uh, Writer's Digest. And as usual, as part of the Authors at Google series, we'll have time for questions at the end. Um, I do want to encourage and remind our, um, our guests today to please use the mics, though we'll be able to hear you um, that we won't be able to capture it for, for the YouTube video. So please try and remember that. And without further ado, please join me in welcoming Meg Clayton to Google. Thanks, Alan. Uh, oh, let's see, now this is, I don't even have to worry about that, right? Okay, thanks, Alan. Um, thank you all for having me. Um, I really wanna thank Tyler uh, Shore as well and Chris Garrison for showing me such a nice uh, way around. Um, you uh, probably know that the whole world is fascinated with Google, uh, and I'm no different from the rest of the world. Uh, when I first heard about authors at Google, I thought, now that would be so cool to be. Uh, but when I got the word that I was actually going to be an author at Google, I thought, uh-oh, what exactly is an author at Google and what do you do? Uh, so I did what anybody would do. I Googled authors at Google. And uh, what I found was, what I was looking for was basically an instruction manual for how one presents to Google. And uh, what I found was a lot of swanky video by swanky writers like Salman Rushdie, who appears to be able to talk for an entire hour extemporaneously and never uh, lose his audience. Um, I found a lot of people who uh, were introduced with long strings of professor this and this important person, part of this important whatever. Uh, and it was a little intimidating, honestly. Uh, but then I thought, but wait, this is Google. And I remembered what uh, my, at the time, 15-year-old son, uh, something that he told me. Uh, I asked him what he was thinking about doing for this summer. And what he said was, well, this is at the ripe old age of 15, well, I'm thinking of applying for a programming job at Google. And I said, hmm. And he said, uh, he said, you know, they'll hire anybody if you can do it. If you can do the job, they're happy to have you. They don't care if you don't have a big name. They don't care if you are 15 years old. Uh, and he actually never got around to putting in that application. He instead uh, was recruited to a startup company uh, and is programming this summer uh, complete with stock options um, at a little startup. It was truly a Silicon Valley story. Uh, he has turned 16, so he's old enough to work now. Um, but so, uh, so with that in mind, I took another peek at those videos. And uh, what I decided was it looked like I could do anything I wanted to do here, uh, which is a little bit scary, a lot of choices. Um, so um, I, I started to think about what I would do here. And for a typical bookstore reading, um, bookstores are, are pretty old school. They basically... Um, you, you, you read a little, you answer a few questions, and you sign a few books. Uh, and from an author's perspective, the signing of the books is the nicest part of writing there is to do. Um, you get to actually write something knowing that the book is there. All you're writing is an inscription in the book. Um, but what I decided here was that um, that was way too old school for Google. 
Uh, and I have this uh, swanky new video, uh, kind of trailer that was done. So I decided to mix it up a little bit. So you guys are my guinea pigs here. I, I've never done this before. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with a little bit about who I am and, and how I got to be a writer. Um, I used to be a lawyer, and I used to do deals for people like Google. Um, and then I'm going to, um, and that story is a little bit of a Google story uh, itself about jumping off and not knowing what you're doing and just doing it anyway. Uh, and then I'm going to um, play the trailer for you. Uh, and then I might read a little bit. I'll tell you a little bit about the book. I might read a little bit. Or actually, the reading is the least favorite part of the readings for me. So I might skip that entirely and just take questions. We'll, we'll see how it's going time-wise and that kind of thing. So um, first of all, uh, the bio. Um, I. When, when I was a kid, I dreamed of being a writer. That was absolutely you know, what I wanted to be. And if I couldn't be a writer, I'd love to have been an astronaut. Those were kind of my two dreams. Um, and that was in the time before anybody, I'm a little bit older than probably anybody in this room, with the possible exception of my husband. Um, those were the days before anybody had walked on the moon. Um, but being an astronaut or being a writer for me was a bit like you know, being able to leave tall buildings in a single bound. I, it was something that not mere humans did. Somebody who was really talented and who every knew, everybody knew from the day they were born was really talented. And so I didn't really, it wasn't really on the list of career options. Um, I'm the daughter of an accountant and a homemaker. And uh, most of their friends were uh, accountants and homemakers, uh, business people, uh, an occasional doctor, um, thrown in, but not a single artist anywhere in the people that I knew. So I, being a practical girl, went off to law school, got my law degree, and went and started working as a lawyer. I did deals for a number of um, years. And then uh, when I had had my first son and was pregnant with my second son, my husband said, uh, you know, that dream, Meg, you know, that's your dream. This is not your dream. Um, and if you uh, keep at this, you're going to look back on your life and say, gosh, you know, your tombstone's going to say, gosh, I wrote a great indenture. Uh, so what, uh, so, so he said, why don't you just give it a try? And I said, I have no idea what I'm doing. And he said, how are you going to know unless you try? Uh, and so I did. I leaped off the corporate track and um, started writing. And it took me some time to figure out what I was doing, but that's OK. Turns out that with writing as with anything, uh, you can figure out what you're doing if you just put your mind to it, as, as you all know here. Uh, so uh, that's how I got there. I had a first novel published about uh, five years ago now. And this is my second novel coming out. It's called The Wednesday Sisters. And um, I'll describe it a little bit before you before I read. But first, I'm going to play the video trailer, except that it appears. Ah, there we go. Oh, I should explain about this, lest you all think I'm a religious fanatic. Um, I'm working on a new novel, which is uh, the, current, the current title for it is uh, The Catholic Girl's Guide to Survival. And it's another friendship story like the Wednesday Sisters is. But uh, one of the scenes takes place in front of one of my characters is a painter. And one of the things she's painting is uh, that scene, which is a, um, the part over a, an art piece over a, a door in Florence. And so that's what that is. And that's why it's up there, so I can describe it in detail when I'm using it in, in my book. So without further ado, the trailer. Good evening, my fellow Americans. Now it is time to take longer strides. That's one small step for man. The hippies it's and the yippies and the disruptors. It's always been said that women's work was never done. I have a dream. Shut up. 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 Shut up.
it. Now. So that applause should go to, let's see if I shut this down, uh, my stepdaughter, Ashley Clayton, who actually put it together for me. I, um, my, my agent was actually the person who suggested a video trailer for the book. Uh, and she said that some authors were using them to some um, success. And I thought, uh, well, that sounds like a pretty good idea. So I went around hunting around, Googling around on the internet to find uh, book trailers to see what they looked like. Uh, and, and what I saw um, on the whole uh, was not anything that I would forward on to my friends. Uh, and so to pay thousands of dollars for something like what I saw was, um, seemed not to be a good expenditure of my money. Um, and, but I have this very talented stepdaughter who is an actor and who has put on plays for really a shoestring and they've been marvelous. She's very funny and she happens to also, um, to support her life as an actor, uh, make a living um, editing film for all sorts, for PBS and, and places like that. And so I put the book in Ashley's hands and I said, um, Ashley, what do you think about doing a book trailer, trailer for me? And she said, what's a book trailer? And <laughs> I said, well, uh, think movie trailer, but, uh, but for a book. Um, and I said, you can look and see what's out there, but I don't want you to do anything that, like what's out there because I, I just don't think it's, there's much that, that, that is great. Um, and so she took the book and she thought about it for a little bit and she said, well, you know, for movie trailers they do this and they do that. And I could tell she knew what she was talking about and I gave her some money and I said, um, go away and come back with a video trailer. And uh, she called me a couple times to say, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? And I would have no idea what she was talking about. And I would nod or over the phone I would say, that sounds great, that sounds great, Ashley. And um, I just let her run with it uh, because I had confidence in her creativity, I think in the same way that Google has, I mean, it's like Google gives you 20% free time to explore whatever you want, whatever your creative minds want. Um, I think that all of us, given some encouragement and a little time to do something, can come up with some really amazingly creative um, things. Uh, and so that's what Ashley did for me. Um, similarly, for my website, which I just think is gorgeous, um, I looked around at a lot of author websites and um, saw that I could pay a lot of people a lot of money to have a mediocre website. Uh, but then I found one author website that I just loved, and it was uh, done by somebody who it was her first author website she'd ever done. And I hired her, and I set her loose, and uh, she did an amazing job. And I would say things like, my, my website has uh, I call them the character pages. On the home page, there are these buttons that link uh, to a page for each of my five characters, and it speaks, each page speaks about where the character came from and how they relate to me and how they relate to the time and photos and, and that kind of thing. And for the Brett character, uh, where you can find a very goofy uh, picture of myself and my friend Cheryl Cohen when we were in the middle school science fair. Um, but Brett is the scientist of my women. And um, she uh, wanted, as I wanted, to be you know, uh, an astronaut. Uh, and so I, I said, for that page, I'd just really, really like to have a lunar timeline, that race for the moon that ends up with the steps on the moon. And I'd love to have it linked to the video of the steps on the moon. And I'd love to have it linked to um, to Kennedy's speech launching that whole race. Uh, and, but I had no idea. I said, Ilsa, I don't, you can't fit that all on the page, can you? And she said, yes, I can. And um, she came back the next day, it was a literally a few hours later, with uh, this lovely timeline that has one single window in the middle and all the events circling the window. And when you scroll over any one of them, you get uh, a picture from that, you know, that particular launch or that, you know, Sput Sputnik or, or whatever was happening in, in the space race at that point in time. And, um, and then on some of them, you click on them and you get, uh, you get the uh, audio of Kennedy's speech or you get actually the video of the lunar landing. And it's really nifty. So um, it was just an instance of turning a job over to somebody who was, I knew was young and talented and could do it if um, she were given the encouragement to do it. And uh, it worked out terrifically for me. So. Um, so those, actually those two pieces, the, the video and the, um, and the website are, are so, they've turned out so well that my publisher, Ballantine uh, Books, has made them a huge part of the marketing program for the book. Uh, for whatever reason, we were having um, difficulty getting a lot of attention from the 
kind of more, more traditional uh, ways of marking a book, the, the print, uh, major women's magazines and major book reviews and that kind of thing. Uh, so Ballantyne started uh, a marketing move on the internet. They gave away free reader copies on all sorts of um, sites and um, they uh, and they used the website in particular, drove a lot of tra traffic through the website and, and now they are, are launching, actually just yesterday, they launched another um, campaign using the video. Um, and what they're finding is that it's sparking this wonderful little buzz on the internet. So every time I go on the internet, there's another blog where somebody is saying, oh, I read this book and I, when I was through with it, uh, the first thing I did was pick up the phone and call all my best friends just to tell them I loved them. Or, oh, I um, just finished this book and I picked up a pen and started writing a novel myself again for the first time in 10 years. So it, it's just lovely what's happened. And that's all you know, Google-inspired internet, internet um, activity. Um, and honestly, if, uh, if I got nothing more from the book than, than those blog um, responses, uh, I would still feel awfully good about, about how this book's done. Um, but the really good news is that my publisher tells me that the first week, which is a little stub week, numbers are really great. Um, they're very excited about the book. They're astonished at how well it's doing so far in the first four days that it's out. So. Um, so that's it. Oh, I guess I can also say that uh, we're using Google for a lot of what we're doing, among other things. Um, we are using Google Diagnostics to see uh, what goes, th you know, where the, the ads um, click through to, the in to my internet site, my website, and so we can see which ads are generating the most traffic. Is it, you know, this book site, or is it this Runner's World ad, or is it this Writer's Digest ad? Uh, we can see where the traffic is coming from, which will allow us to more carefully market in the future. Um, I also actually dabbled a little bit into Google Ads. I'll tell you, I have a brother who is running for city council in San Jose, and he said, have you tried Google Ads? And I said, uh, no. <laughs> and he showed me how to do it, told me how to do it, said that was one of his major marketing tools for his run for city council. I will tell you that he is a Republican. I am not. Um, but he was uh, running in a race where uh, there was no chance that he would get any traction because he was a Republican. And um, he got one of the two runoff spots. And he attributes a lot of that to Google Ads. So you guys have um, changed the world in a lot of ways. And you're changing the world for the book world as well. So, all right, so I'm going to introduce the book, and I'm going to read uh, a short passage, or two short passages, and then um, questions anybody. So, all right, let me go water here. Uh, so the book is uh, The Wednesday Sisters. This little, this is a little note from my uh, public, or from the head of marketing actually at Ballantyne. It came with, this is the first copy of the book that I ever saw. And so, and it's got a smiley face because we're all really thrilled about it. But I, I taped it on here so that I would remember that when I'm doing presentations like this, I'm supposed to smile. So it says, you probably can't read it here, but it says happy publication right there at the top. And she's a really, Kim Hovey, she's just a really amazing person. So. But I'm actually not going to read from the book because my publicist has taught me it's actually easier to read from blank pages. So, um, so the book is uh, set in Silicon Valley, as Alan said. It is a story of five women who are um, moms and homemakers and pretty committed to uh, that kind of suburban life uh, when the women's movement uh, looms on the scene. And they it's, it's very much about how the women's movement changed um, the world for everybody, even uh, my five characters, you know, four of whom would never in a million years at the time anyway, have called themselves a feminist, and the last of which would perhaps have, perhaps not. Um, they are not they are mostly college educated. They are not women who uh, raced off to be the first women who went to law school uh, or anything like that. They're just regular people like my mom was at the time. Um, but the story is uh, primarily about friendship. Uh, it's certainly meant to be a tribute to my own friends who have been wonderfully inspiring to me and also to my mom's friends who I watched over the years support each other through a lot of good stuff and bad stuff. Um, and as Alan said, it's uh, set in the Silicon Valley. Um, one of the things that I was really interested in doing was uh, following, uh, I, one of the things I looked at early on in the researching of the book was uh, how many women there were in tech companies in uh, the Silicon Valley. And the answer was pretty much 
zero. Um, but I wanted to have that presence in the book because it is such a, you can't tell a Palo Alto story. I mean, Palo Alto is a place where things start in garages. I mean, how can you tell a Palo Alto story without telling a little bit of that? Um, so uh, one of my uh, character's husbands is a, um, is a is a engineer and uh, he comes out to work for Fairchild Semiconductors and uh, he leaves very early on to join another startup uh, at the time because I just found it so interesting the way startups start with literally you know holes in the floor sometime or in garages and that kind of thing and explored that um, and so he leaves a nice secure job very early on and, and goes to this startup that um, ends up very well as so many stories do in the Silicon Valley. Uh, he actually the, the company he joins ends up being Intel and part of the reason I uh, picked that was because Intel has a very fascinating story and uh, part of the reason I know that is because there's a lovely book uh, by Leslie Berlin called uh, um, The Man Behind the Microchip Chip, uh, Robert Noyce and the Invention of Silicon Valley. It's a terrific um, it's a terrific look at that early Silicon Valley history. And if you all haven't read it, uh, I highly recommend it. It's wonderful. OK, so the Wednesday Sisters. Oh, and I'll tell you, I'm reading two short sections. Uh, the first one is very short. It's just the two paragraphs from the beginning of the book. It's meant mainly just to introduce you to the five women and kind of the spirit of the book. Uh, and then the second part will be uh, what I call the lunar landing scene. And I'll give you a little introduction to that when I get to that. The Wednesday sisters look like the kind of women who might meet at those fancy coffee shops on university. We do look that way, but we're not one bit fancy. We're not sisters either. We don't even meet on Wednesdays, although we did at the beginning. We met at the swings at Party Park on Wednesday mornings when our children were young. It's been 35 years, though, more than 35, since we w switched from Wednesdays at 10 to Sundays at dawn. Sunrise, whatever time the light first crests the horizon that time of year. It suits us to leave our meeting time up to the tilt of the earth, the track of the world around the sun. That's us there in the photograph. Yes, that's me, in one of my chubbier phases. Although I suppose one of these days, I'll have to face up to the fact that it's the thinner me that's the phase, not the chubbier one. And going left to right, that's Linda, her hair loose and combed. But then she brought the camera. She was the only one who knew we'd be taking a photograph. Next to her is Allie, pale as ever. And then Kath. And the one in the white gloves in front, the one in the coffin, that's Brett. All right, so that's uh, five women meeting in a park in Palo Alto. Uh, it's told retrospectively from the uh, standpoint of 35 years um, so that I can have it all in the perspective that is interesting to see it from, from where it is now. Um, the next thing I'll read is uh, what I call the lunar la landing scene. Uh, it's July 29th, 1969. Uh, I know Mac was alive then. Anybody else in the room alive then even? Oh, a few people, a few people, there you go. Um, I was uh, 10 years old on that day, and I remember it. It's one of my very most distinctive memories from when I was a kid. Um, uh, that having been said, I... Um, don't remember anything from when I was 10 with any real clarity. Uh, so one of the things I did was I uh, got the footage from, um, from Blockbuster and actually watched it on my television. Uh, I tried to get my kids to watch it with me and be the kids that you'll see in the scene, but they were not interested. Um, but I did watch it on the smallest TV we have in our, in our home so that I would have the experience of, more like the experience of watching it then. And it is, the footage I had anyway was black and white, so it was a pretty re realistic um, look at it. So all you have to know for this scene, uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I call it the four eights. There are eight adults in the room. That's four of my five characters and their husbands. Uh, there are eight children in the room, all of whom are under the age of eight. Um, and they're watching on something pretty close to an eight inch screen because the TVs were pretty small that, that uh, back then. So uh, I think you know everybody huddled around this little screen waiting for this moment that um, that historically was a very, a very exciting moment to, to actually happen. OK. Um, we sat on the floor, huddled around Linda's new zenith giant screen color television, a 23-inch screen set in an oak veneer cabinet, watching the footage from Cape Canaveral for the longest time, beginning to despair of ever seeing a man step out of the landing module. 
When you remember it and you don't think carefully about what you remember, you think Neil Armstrong just stepped down the ladder and onto the moon and said, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. But in reality, it was more like the eagle has landed. We listened to the audio of them opening the door forever, feeling more tension than any thriller movie could ever deliver. We sat watching and explaining to the things to the children. No, honey, that's the man's name isn't Houston. He's in a city called Houston. There was a picture, finally, and the fellow in Houston said there was a great deal of contrast. It was upside down, but they could make out a fair amount of detail. Even knowing it was upside down, though, I couldn't make out one speck of anything. Just gray at the bottom, and a band of sunlight cutting diagonally across the top, and something that had to be some part of the landing module, but you wouldn't know that if you didn't know. I don't see it, Daddy, Anna Page said, and Maggie echoed her, and then all the children were starting to whine that they couldn't see either. We couldn't hear them either then, and all we could do was shush them and watch and listen more carefully. Linda grabbed a box of cookies finally and said as long as the children were quiet, they could eat as many as they wanted to. There was movement in one quarter of the lighted slash, something blocking the sunlight right at the module. Brett leaned toward the screen and touched, and touched it. See that, she said. That's the, her voice faltered, and for a moment there was only the clean white of her glove touching the shadow of the screen, her eyes pooling and blinking. Watching her, I wondered about her gloves for the first time in months. They'd just become a part of her to me, and yet there was something more than that, really. There was some sadness under those gloves that none of us, not even Linda, would ask her to revisit just to satisfy our curiosity. I suppose we all felt she'd share it with us in time. That's the astronaut coming out onto the moon, she managed. And Chip pulled her to him then and linked his fingers with hers. It is, Anna Page said, disappointment thick in her voice. Lee touched a lock of her hair under her hat. The camera has to send the signal all the way from the moon, Pumpkin, he said. It isn't as good a picture as the Saturday morning cartoons because it has to travel all that way. Linda's Julie said, and it's real. Cartoons aren't real. And we were silent then, absorbing that. This was real. The camera angle changed somehow, which made me wonder where this camera was. Chip explained, they just flipped the image. We were seeing it right side up now and closer in. And Houston said, OK, Neil, we can see you coming down the ladder now. And then I could see that the thing cutting off sunlight could maybe be Neil Armstrong's legs making their way toward the moon. You couldn't see much, though. You couldn't see his body or his head, just darkness at the top of the screen. These guys need to do a stint in film school, Jeff said. Chip pulled Brett closer, her cropped red hair brushing against his black glasses as he whispered something in her ear. That should be you, I imagined him saying. In a more perfect world, Brett, that would be you stepping out onto the moon. Houston said something about shadow photography, and the camera view changed again. And there was Neil Armstrong, ghost-like, yes. But you could see the ladder and the whiteness of a huge headed man in a white spacesuit with a big pack strapped to his back. You could make out that he was turning toward the camera and looking down. And he was talking about the surface, saying it was like powder, and the feet of the landing module had sunk into it, but not too far. Then he was stepping off the lamb, and it was just as Maggie was saying, Daddy, he's standing on a baby sheep, that Armstrong finally said, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Not until then. His words were all crackling, too. And I wondered if that was the transmission, or if the tears were welling in his eyes, the same as they were in mine. Mama, why are you crying, Anna Page said. And I saw that Cass's eyes were tearing too, and Linda's were moist, and Brett was wiping whole streams from her cheeks. 
And while Neil Armstrong was talking about his footprints, how he only sunk into the surface a little bit and he had no difficulty moving around, Lee put his arm around Calf and pulled her toward Anna Page and him. It's the first time in history, Anna Page, that man has set his feet down on something other than this earth or what was made on this earth, he said. Watch closely, Pumpkin. This is something to remember your whole long life. The children, tiring of a picture that was often too wavy or too dark or too fuzzy to make out much of anything, began dropping off to sleep. They missed Neil Armstrong, half running, half floating across the moon's surface, the sunlight reflecting off his spacesuit so he looked like the Holy Ghost himself. They missed Buzz Aldrin's joke about being sure not to lock them out of the module. And the plaque, we come in peace for all mankind, and the raising of the flag, not so much a raising as an opening and planting, the stars and stripes sticking straight out as if hung from a taut line, laundry line. No wind on the moon, Brett explained. So they ran a pole through the top of it to make it look good. And it did. It looked beautiful, catching the sun, the stripes so clear that even the children could have seen they were watching an American flag being placed on the moon. Then President Nixon was saying the heavens had now become a part of our world. And for once, all the people of the world were truly one which seems a little sappy now, and yes, it was Nixon, but it wasn't Watergate Nixon yet, and it was moving, it was. As the children slept, we watched the shadow men in their spacesuits floating back and forth across the screen, taking soil samples and running experiments, negotiating their way back into the capsule, closing the hatch again, all while the camera left on the surface of the moon sent back footage of an unwavering flag posted in front of the silent ship. I remember thinking about Michael Collins, the command module pilot who was destined to become the trivia question, the final jeopardy, even though he spent the same eight days in space that Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin did, not even able to watch these first steps on the moon that could not have been made without him. I wondered how they chose who did what. If it was alphabetical, he got a bad draw even as a C. I imagined him still orbiting in the spaceship, alone on the dark side of the moon, and how very happy he must be to see the Earth rise over the moon's surface each time he came back around. So that's my, thank you. Uh, so that's my lunar landing scene. In, in many ways, it's not typical of the book, but in, in many ways, it is. Uh, it certainly evokes the time, and it's a piece that I can read without explaining to you 18 different things that happened before it to make it all make sense. Um, it is part of the great fun of doing this book for me, which was doing the research in the Silicon Valley. Um, there is just a, such a great uh, trove of material and um, wonderful, wonderful um, archives, that photographs and that kind of thing that you could look at, that it was uh, half the fun of writing the book was, was learning about the Silicon Valley in that time. So uh, I guess I'll open the floor up to questions and um, see what I can tell anybody. I have a two-part question for you, Meg. Uh, the first one is just maybe some thoughts or reflections on how you feel about the act of writing itself, and then just a more just for my own curiosity, like the specifics about how you go about doing it. So for me personally, writing is just something I have to do every day. It's like, some, like going to the gym, an hour or two is writing time no matter what. But I'm curious as like a professional writer like yourself, how you feel about that. Uh, I am uh, more disciplined about my writing than I am about going to the gym. <laughs> I, my, uh, the way I do it, I actually have when I'm writing first draft, which is by far the hardest part for me is getting the first draft and especially getting the first few words of first draft. Uh, I have um, actually rules for myself and my rule is uh, 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. or 2,000 words, whichever comes first. And so if I've written 2,000 words by 9 in the morning, I can do whatever I want. I can go have lunch with my friend Kim Jabal, or I can uh, go out for a long run, or I can eat bonbons and watch soap operas, whatever I feel like. Um, the honest truth is if I have 2,000 words by any time in the morning, I am not getting up from that chair because that's just going to be a really terrific writing day, and I'm not going to leave the computer until I catch everything I can. Um, 
getting started is, is really very much the hardest part for me uh, for anything. And so I have a, oh, I don't have my journal prop. I have a little um, journal that I carry with me everywhere. It's in my bag sitting next to my husband right now. Um, but it allows me to, to start writing without feeling like I'm starting writing. Uh, and so, for example, for the we Wednesday Sisters, uh, the Wednesday Sisters was a title in my computer for about a year and a half before it was anything. And then one day I had an idea for a character with white gloves, but that was all it was. It, was a, it wasn't even a character, it was just a character trait, somebody who wore white gloves at a time when, when, when women didn't still. Um, but and the next day, and it was a tough time in my writing life. My first novel was not selling as well as I hoped. Uh, and I was having trouble getting another one going. Um, and uh, so I took my journal to the Stanford uh, Union, the tables outside there where, where it's lovely, tr tree shades and round tables. And I sat down with my journal. And this journal entry is really funny because it starts uh, basically feeling incredibly well run dry today, like I'll never write another word. Uh, and I was just, it's just this lovely little pity party for myself uh, where I'm thinking about actually going back to the practice of law or something drastic like that. Uh, and, but what I did instead, because I'm a writer, is I sat down and wrote. Uh, and I wrote that just garbage first. And then a woman walked across my field of vision. She was wearing a red Stanford cap. She had a blonde braid coming out the back of her hat. I didn't even see her face. She headed into the union probably to buy a sub Subway sandwich or something. And uh, my mind went, oh, she could be a Wednesday sister. And I have a story for her all of a sudden. And, and I just started taking notes to what was kind of coming in my mind. And by the time I looked up a couple of hours later, I, I really had the guts of the story. It was going to be a friendship story. It was going to be about five women. I had uh, five characters, all of whom had uh, you know some story, or at least some start of a story to tell. Um, and uh, there were a lot of things that were different. Uh, you know, the, the narrator who's named Frankie in the book was named Bernie in that little sitting. And um, things moved around. Something that was going to be one person's character trait or problem moved to another person. Um, but it was all there. And so every time I don't want to write in the morning, I, I have a little tab on. I tab things with these like little things. So I have a little tab on that thing in that particular journal, which I keep very handy. And if I don't feel like writing in the morning, I just go back to that tab. And I remember why I sit down to write every day. Um, so that's part of the question. I think I missed part of the question. Is that? Oh, I think part of it was already incorporated in your answer was just how you feel about writing in general. Or, or oh, I, oh, the answer to that is that I feel absolutely blessed to, to be a writer. I, I had a great time practicing law, um, and I really enjoyed it. But it, I was in it for the adrenaline rush, basically. You know, you sit down across the table and negotiate. It's a lot of fun. You're, you know, testing wits against somebody. Uh, writing's a much lonelier life. I find that um, I reach out a lot to other writers for the social part of the um, experience. Um, but I do feel absolutely blessed to be able to call myself a writer and write every day. Mm -hmm. Money's not as good as practicing law. I'll tell you that. So but, I've heard. Um, Pardon? So that's what I've heard. Yeah, yeah. But, um, but the rewards, the other rewards you get are just amazing. I mean, among, among other things, even if I weren't getting published, I have come to know myself so much better as a writer than I ever did before. Uh, it allows me to contemplate my life and the lives around me and the world around me. It allows me to stand in the, D and you're not going to believe this, but to stand in the DMV line uh, while you know waiting for my number to be called and just watch people and think about uh, who they are and what their lives are like and develop, I develop little stories for people all over the place. So it's made me a more patient person. Um, made me a better parent, I think. Uh, so it's great. I, I absolutely love it. Absolutely. All right. Thanks. Hi, Meg. Thank you for coming. Um, I wanted to learn a little bit more about the decision to leave law and become a writer, just because it seems like such a, a bold and, you know, very obviously very uh, very risky choice, <laughs> and I think that a lot of us, you know, kind of have those sort of those dreams and those things we'd like to do with our lives, but you know, don't really pursue them for whatever reason. Um, so I'd like to learn a little bit more about what encouraged you to pursue writing. Obviously, a very, uh, very supportive husband was one of those aspects, and also, what are some of the challenges you encountered, and how did you overcome them? Uh, yeah, well, um, uh, as I said before, Mac was a huge. Um, a huge encouragement to me to, to take the leap, because it's a scary thing to take a leap from something that you know you do well and you're making a lot of money doing uh, into something that 
I mean, I was a math science kid. My weakest, um, my weakest subject was English. I mean, it was the one class I did an AP in in high school. And when I got to college, I took uh, great books, which I was required to take first term. A second term, I, my freshman year, I took a Shakespeare class. And uh, then I said, Phew, done with that, no more English. And then they actually offered, my junior year, they offered a class on Tolkien. And I'm a big Lord of the Rings fan. Uh, and so I did take that. Uh, but I took it pass fail, and it was a class that was uh, filled mostly with uh, max, math science geek like, geeks like me. Um, so I, I did. It was something that I had no confidence that I could do. Um, but honestly, it was my dream. And, I, and you think at some point in time. I mean, I was in my 30s when I started writing again. Uh, and at some point in time, you think, well, if you don't give it a try, then you just may as well, you know, curl up in your coffin and die. So um, I, I leapt, and I. I didn't know what I was doing. I, um, I, my first novel took me 10 years to, to get right before it was published. Um, I published a lot of short stories in between and that kind of thing. But the first thing I, because I read novels, the first thing I sat down to write was a novel. And that ended up being my first novel, you know, my first novel draft uh, 18,163, I think it probably was. Um, there's so much you can learn about anything, as, as you guys know. I, I mean, at Google, you guys say, t you know, take this and, and figure out how to do it and run with it, and you all do that. And I think that's true of everything, and it's certainly true of writing. So um, uh, that having been said, uh, I will tell you that uh, before I left the practice of law, we did um, take a check in the checkbook to see uh, how much money was there. And uh, having some financial flexibility to be able to make that kind of leap certainly is. Uh, let's just say the, call, the, the money for our kids' college funds was put away before I ever did this so that um, there wasn't that risk. So it was, less, it was only an ego risk, not a financial risk for me. So. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? So what are some of the things that have surprised you about the publication process? You know, from you're starting your book and you're writing it, you think it's at the final draft, and what is the process that you go through, and what are some of the great surprises that you've encountered? Uh, one of, I mean, uh, the short answer is that everything about the publication process has been a huge surprise, and, and not always good, but, but often good. Uh, I would say one of the biggest surprises for me was how long it takes. I, um, I come from the legal world uh, where we did M&A work and, and corporate finance work, and you have to do that quickly when the market is right and to get the deals done, and the client never wants to wait till tomorrow. They always want it to be done today. And so everything happens like, you know, we would do a big deal, you know, a billion-dollar deal in 48 hours because that was the time we had to do it. Um, and everybody would stay up all night to get it done, and it was this great uh, team effort. Um, by contrast, the the writing world is very lonely. I'm you know, just there, me, me and my little computer, or my little journal, whatever, every day. Um, but it's also enormously slow. So the Wednesday Sisters, for example, sold. Uh, I, was, I traveled to Vietnam um, a year and a half ago now. And my agent, and I delivered it to my agent the day I was leaving. And she said, she called me up uh, as I was you know, closing my suitcase and said, I want to change two words, these words to this word. Is that all right? And I said, can you do it on your computer? Mine is already shut down. <laughs> and she said, sure. And she did that. And she sent it out. She said, oh, don't worry. I, um, I, I'm just going to send it out. And I will tell them I'm, I'm not t entertaining offers until um, until you get back from Vietnam. Well, uh, I suppose like anything else, the result of that is that everybody wants to get their offer in right away. Uh, and so the book sold very quickly while I was in Vietnam. And we had these funny little, you know, I'd wake up in, in the uh, morning and there'd be an email message about what was going on. But then it was the middle of the night in New York. So that was all kind of funky. But that is uh, pretty much uh, my, the only quick experience I've had for anything in publishing. Um, so that was a year ago, April. So it's been, is that uh, eight, 16, 16 months? Something like that. It's been quite, quite a while since then. And, um, and everything happens very slowly. They need a year to get the book set, and they need a year to you know, get, decide how they're going to pitch it and how they're going to advertise it and, and all that kind of thing. Uh, and it, it is just really, 
I'll tell you, for my first novel, I was totally shocked. My first novel was with a different press, and I sent them, when I sent them the final manuscript, I sent them a disk version, because this was before you could email an entire file, before you had these big Google email capacities, or you could uh, email an entire file, which is what I do now. But So I sent them a disk copy, and my editor called me up and said, basically, uh, thanks for the disk copy, Meg, but we actually uh, re-input it all, <laughs> which is kind of shocking. I think they're still, um, the publishing world is, is they're moving along, um, but they're still a little bit behind the Googles of the world in terms of relying on technology. So that, that's been a big shock. The other thing that's surprised me, because everybody kind of whines about how bad publishing it is and how hard it is to get published and how, um, how dismal it is out there for fiction and that kind of thing, and how editors don't edit anymore and, and that kind of thing. One of the things I found is that it isn't a huge margin business anymore. Uh, the net result of that is that you, everybody who's in the book business now is there because they love literature, because they love what they're doing, or because it's a passion for them. And so my experience with the people who are, I've worked with uh, on this book certainly uh, has just been terrific. It's been a really nice, wonderful group of people. You have to use the microphone so everybody can hear. It's going to be a quick one. No, I, just... I can also repeat the question if anybody's too into no, it. Just on that topic, I'm curious. I think it's so cool what you did with like the YouTube trailer and like the marketing on the internet. So I'm just curious on this topic, was that mostly you pushing this or was, is Valentine kind of, are these big publishing companies really starting to move in that direction? Uh, I, I clearly, the big publishing companies, or clearly Ballantine at least, is, is definitely moving in that direction. But like all of us, nobody knows what works or how to do it yet. And so it's, it's been a real experience. The video trailer as an idea started with my, ed, uh, my agent, Marley Rusoff, who I think walks on water. Uh, and she uh, suggested it to me because she had another client who'd done one that was, was pretty good. Um, I think that, so, so I said, okay, uh, I don't know how we're going to use this thing, but let's go ahead and give it a try. Um, and, and we developed it. And, and then it turns out that kind of in, in the interim between when we started doing that, people are starting to figure out what to do. So I, Valentine actually has a person in charge of internet advertising now. Um, and that person is, uh, so I sent it to my publisher and they did things like sent it out with a, a newsletter that they, um, that they send out once a month. And um, they are arranging for it to be posted on my Amazon page so that if you go to buy my book on Amazon, you can click there and, and see. It's on Google videos now. Um, it's on YouTube, uh, places like that. But it is definitely the whole how you market on the internet is something we are all learning uh, by the seat of our pants. And I think my impression from the response I've gotten from Valentine is that uh, I know that they had they had another book called Loving Frank by a writer named Nancy Horan, I think is her name, um, that is a lovely book. And they started doing some stuff with her. They did a video trailer for her, but video interview for her. And they set up a website and a chat online. And they had a lot of success with that. It ended up on the New York Times bestseller list. Um, but I think that was their first real kind of push into uh, internet marketing. Uh, and, and this one, they're, they're doing even a, more than that. Um, but again, I mean, so the video that they arranged was a video interview, which is, it's interesting. And it's hard to imagine that, I mean, it's, it's me talking mixed with some images and that kind of thing, me reading a little bit. Uh, I'm made up, so I don't exactly look like me, but <laughs> it's kind of interesting. They did my hair, which I usually do myself. Um, but, uh, they, but, but it's hard to imagine something like that, you know, going viral or anything, you know, I mean, who, uh, beyond my mom, who wants to me to see, to, to see me um, speaking. So they used it for things like pitching me for media, television, and that kind of thing, um, journalism. But um, the, how to do a video trailer for a book is new stuff. It's uh, all interesting. It's going to be interesting to see how, how it goes. We had a longer version of the trailer um, at first, and then we cut it down to 80 seconds. The Valentine people said, let's get it under 80 seconds because people on the internet don't have that much patience. Um, but the longer, longer book uh, trailer had something like 500 hits in a very short time. So that, you know, that was good news. And I'm seeing the trailer now showing up on people's blogs and that kind of thing. So we're hopeful. We'll see. Yeah, absolutely. So how much, uh, how much control do you have with Valentine now in the editing process, in the cover of the book? Um, and are you, do you try to then market it to become a movie at some point? Or 
what is yeah, if, if anybody in this room knows anybody in Hollywood or Oprah, please you know, <laughs> give me the introduction. Um, uh, the answer is that I have um, ultimate control over the words in the book and uh, very little control over anything else. Um, so I, you know, the, my editor will suggest edits and I'll take them or not as, as I think they're appropriate or not, if I think they'll improve the book. And so the, the words are, are very much mine, um, with help, obviously. I mean, I have a great editor and she did a great job. Her name is Robin Rolowitz and she did a great job editing the book. Um, beyond that, uh, everything is a marketing decision and it's probably a really, really good, um, idea not to have those decisions in my hands because I'm not a marketing person. Um, so the cover, for example, well, they do take, you know, they do take my input and ask my, my opinion. Um, so they sent me a cover that was not this cover, this lovely journal and, and, and everything. Uh, and I loved it. And the publisher loved it. And the head of marketing loved it. And my editor loved it. And they said, oh, we're going to go with that. That'll be great. We're just going to, except, well, my agent said, no, nah, it's a little too chiclety. And somebody in her office said, no, it's a little too chiclety. This is not a chiclet book. Um, and so, uh, it was, so what Ballantyne decided to do was send it out to the sales force and see what they thought. And what they thought was um, some of the people absolutely loved it like we did, and the people who didn't love it absolutely hated it. Um, it was, it was um, three women sitting on a bench. It was not 1960s, but, but that was okay. Um, and, and they have great body language, so it was a very fun cover. But it had over their faces, because they wanted it to be kind of they want people to be able to imagine themselves as these women. It had over their uh, faces a journal page um, with the title, you know, by Meg White Clayton and that kind of thing, um, the Wednesday Sisters. And um, and uh, it, I, we came to affectionately call that uh, that cover "Decapitated Women." And and that's what bothered some people was that the women were headless. And and it, you know, especially with everything that was going on in the Middle East and people, you know, it was just uh, that you know, if you if you had that reaction to it, it was hard to look at the cover again the same way. So then we went through eight, ten more covers, and they would send me covers in batches and say, what do you think of these? And I'd say, oh, gosh, that woman's anorexic. Don't put her on my cover. And um, they'd say, you're right, you're right, sorry. Uh, and, but then they, and so the day that they do something called an advanced reader copy, which is a softbound, looks like a paperback a version that they use to reach out to media and, and people like that. Um, they did an advanced reader version of it, and the day that that cover had to go, they had to have a cover for the printer and they were finally deciding, well, maybe we'll use that for, first cover and come, come up. They, um, they provided me a, I woke up literally at 6.30 in the morning, opened my email and there was an email saying, um, please, please look at this co cover. Do you like it? We all love it here. We need to know by, you know, a quarter of seven year time, if you're not up and looking at your email pretty soon, we're going to call you <laughs> and wake you up. Uh, and I opened it and I thought, Oh, well, that's not too bad. It was different. It was, didn't have the yellow in the middle. It didn't have the green on the side or the green here. And so it was a little dark. It was a little dark. Um, but I said, yeah, it's fine. Um, it's a little dark. And my agent said, oh, it's great. It just needs cover uh, or just needs color. And so they added color to it. And the package ended up beautifully. I'm so pleased. You, I watch people in the bookstores. And they pick up the book. And they, they see it because it's right there at the front of Barnes and & Noble and places like that, which is really nice. Um, and they look at the cover. And, and then they turn it over and look at the back. And there are these lovely blurbs that some you know, writers who'd read it before it was published gave me. And they're all really nice. There are things like, you know, Lolly Winston says, this book reminded me of why I love to read. I mean, I would have paid her a lot of money for that quote, but I, I didn't have to. <laughs> um, and then they open it up and, and look at the first paragraph. And a lot of times they walk out of the, of the store with it, fortunately. So. Um, but so the marketing is n not me at all. Although I do. I mean, I did do the trailer. I certainly am pitching in you know, anything that works here. I'm doing it. So um, I spend a lot of time on the website, a lot of time on the video. Um, but I don't know how to do anything with those things. So they're, they're the ones who are saying, we're going to do this with this. We're going to do that with that. We're going to drive the traffic this way to your website and that kind of thing. Um, as someone who obviously did not witness the lunar landing, um, mm -hmm. I really enjoyed that uh, little piece you just read there. Uh, oh, and you. I know that writers sometimes write themselves into their characters. So I was kind of wondering, um, you know, you obviously drew a lot upon your memories of the lunar landing. Uh, do you view yourself as one of the Wednesday sisters, or do you view them as yourself as part of each of them? Uh, the answer to that is, uh, I am not any of them, and I am all of them. Um, the, the, I have a, a 
a, a page for each of them on my website, and each page talks a little bit about what part of me is, is in each of them. Um, and so, for example, Frankie, the book opens with Frankie uh, moving into Palo Alto from Chicago. She has never in her life lived anywhere but Chicago. She has never had to make a friend since she was in kindergarten. Um, and she's nervous about that move and about whether she'll ever make friends. Um, I went to, I think, 10 different grade schools when I was growing up. I moved so many times that it's hard to say what's home for me. Um, but that, that experience of moving into a new place and not knowing anybody is definitely my experience. And that is definitely drawn from um, my own feelings about going into that situation. And so uh, that's true of all, all the characters in the book have some little piece of me. Um, Linda's mother died of breast cancer before the book opens. Uh, and my mom is a breast cancer survivor, and my grandmother did not survive. Um, and so that Linda's anxieties for herself and for her children are, are very much my own anxieties for myself and my children. Um, there is a, one of the characters, Allie, has a, um, I will just call it, for, for not wanting to give anything away, a, a middle of the night wandering toward the end of the book. Uh, that comes almost directly from the pages of my journal. And um, it's interesting, I had, I, I, I ate your wonderful food at your, at your wonderful cafeteria uh, downstairs um, right before this. And uh, one of the things I had was um, swordfish with a squid ink sauce. And it was absolutely delicious. I can't believe that you guys get to eat this every day. I'm thinking of applying for a job at Google. Um, but uh, the squid ink is, uh, it, it made me laugh because the, the de part of the dedication on my book is, I have two sons, Chris and Nick, and so it's uh, for Chris and Nick, fine purveyors of tooth fairy magic and squid ink. And the, the reason for that is because uh, when you, certainly if you have kids and you're thinking about writing, start keeping a journal now because your kids do the most amazing things and you can never make it up as well as they actually do it in life. So. When I was uh, in my early years as a writer, when I was trying to get some traction, I started sending out short stories. I could get my nonfiction published, but I was having trouble getting my fiction published. And so I get back these rejection letters. So my son Nicholas comes home from school one day with uh, this little toilet paper squid that he's made in kindergarten or whatever it is. Uh, and this squid, when you when you blow on one end of the toilet paper roll, this little um, black piece of, uh, of uh, construction paper rolls out, and that's the squid ink. And so he gave it to me, and he says, so, so, so here, Mommy, now when you get a rejection, you can just squid ink it, and it'll make you feel better. And I did, and it did. <laughs> so that's where the squid ink comes from. Uh, similarly, there's a, tooth, uh, there's a first loss of a tooth scene in the book that, again, comes straight from my kids' journals. So. Follow up to the last question, how much you saw yourself in the characters. If I have the dates right, the characters are about 20 years older than you. They're not your peers. So was that uh, an issue? Or you, did you have to do research? Are you confident in the, your, you got their voices? Um, how was that? Oh, thank you. They're actually probably about uh, 10 or 15 years older than I am, but that's great. <laughs> um, uh, I'll take that compliment. Um, I did a lot of research. Um, certainly, uh, the, the women are, to a large extent, in terms of there was certainly a lot of my mom and her friends in there, and, and the experiences that some of them had um, are certainly the experiences that I saw my mom's friends go through. Um, but I also did a ton of research on all sorts of different things. Uh, among other things, one of the things I did was I looked back at my own high school yearbook, because I started high school the year that Title IX passed, um, but before it was implemented. And it's interesting to see the effect that Title IX had just in my uh, particular high school yearbook series, because uh, my freshman year, there were literally you know, 35 pages of boys sports and three pages of girls sports. There were six, page, there were six girls sports at the time. Uh, each got half a page and two of the girls sports that were offered were bowling and archery. No track even uh, offered to girls at my school when I started high school. Um, by the end of high school, and, and, and the 35 boys pages came first and then the six girls pages at the end. By the end of my senior year, it's looking better. Um, there are, you know, the, the girls basketball shows up behind the boys basketball as opposed to all the way behind, you know, boys wrestling or whatever. Um, yeah, so, so, but, but, but I don't remember that. I don't remember that there was not a girls track team in my high school. Um, I remember that my sophomore year, 
they, I, I didn't remember that it wasn't there freshman year. I do remember being recruited my sophomore year to shot put because um, I could throw really well. Um, but I was not going to shot put because the only shot putters I knew were all those East German women who were, you know, very, very. Uh, and I didn't want to be, I wanted to be more feminine than that. I mean, there was this whole thing that, that women who did sports, and especially sports like that, were, were not feminine. And um, it's really interesting to see how much things like that have changed. And so that certainly is, um, is one of the things I look back and somebody do things like, well, were baby bottles plastic then, or were they glass? There are just so many things that have changed, it's really interesting. And I definitely um, had to research all that to, to figure it out, because I didn't know. Were there pampers then, or was it cloth, you know? Um, what was happening? But that's the fun part, learning. I feel like I learned so much about the time that wasn't mine. And then uh, certainly I talked to women of my mom's generation to get um, some of their, their feedback. So you talked about like moving from being a lawyer to writing and that you didn't really have that background. What did you do when you first kind of hit that first page? Did you take classes? Did you just write and then have people edit it for you? Like what kinds of resources? Like how do you even make a transition like that, I guess? Um, I, that's a great question. I uh, actually, since I had no idea what I was doing, I took a class. I signed up for an extension class at a local university. And um, I went in for the first meeting. And this young um, woman writer, her name was Jennifer Allen, uh, came in. We're all sitting, maybe 18 of us sitting around a table. She took um, a, a paper lunch bag, you know, one of those brown paper lunch bags. Um, she said, hi. We all introduced ourselves. She dumped the bag over the table. A bunch of junk spilled out, keys and all sorts of weird things. Uh, and she said, OK, this is a writer's class. Uh, we're all going to write for five minutes. Don't worry. You won't have to read. And so we all put our little heads. She said, ready, set, go. Uh, we all put our heads down. We all wrote something. Uh, and then when the time was up, she said, time. OK, who wants to read first? <laughs> and, I, and I am not a person who uh, is comfortable with doing anything in public much. Uh, and so I immediately eyed the door and thought, as soon as she call, gets somebody reading, I'm out that door. So she looked at me and said, how about you, Meg? <laughs> and I went, uh-oh. But I read. And uh, people laughed at the parts they were supposed to laugh at. It was just uh, two paragraphs, I think. Uh, and they didn't uh, laugh at anything that wasn't supposed to be funny. And uh, I survived the experience. And then we went on to the next person. And I could sit back and, and relax and enjoy the rest of that class. It was great for me because it got my pen going. And, and it was something that I didn't know how to do. Um, and so. One of the things I've done as a result of that experience is they're certainly, in the book, um, the, the writers, they are not writers when they start out the book. And so there are certainly many ways that they use to get them themselves writing. Um, but also on my website, I have a writer's page. It's you know, one of my links at the top. I, I had to negotiate hard for the space because my publisher wanted a book group page, and I wanted a writer page. And we were having trouble fitting it all in, but, um, but Ilsa fit it all in. Um, so, uh, and, and that has, in, uh, one of the things on it is a, it's a page of just ways to get started. You know, ideas to spur your imagination. You know, look at a photograph, uh, dump out your purse and just pick one item and start writing about it. Um, just little things like that to, to get your ink flowing. That's actually a, uh, a great story and an incredibly um, great place to, uh, to wrap things up, Meg, it's been wonderful having you here. And I think for, for those of us that are aspiring writers, uh, some, some tips to, uh, to step out, either, uh, either writing or to pursue other dreams that you might have. I just want to really thank you for coming today. And for those of you that haven't had the pleasure of reading The Wednesday Sisters, you must do it. And you must tell at least 10 people uh, <laughs> how you felt about the book and encourage them as well. Thanks again, Meg. Thank you so much, Alan. Thanks, everybody.